Good evening and welcome to City Limits. I'm Dan Chemis, the mayor of Missoula. This is the first in a series of monthly programs which I'll be hosting here on MCAT the second Tuesday of every month at this hour. Each month we'll discuss a topic of interest to Missoula citizens and their government. Starting in January, we hope to be able to receive and respond to calls from viewers. Tonight we can't do that, but we do have an interesting topic to discuss. Our topic is baseball, whether or not Missoula should attempt to acquire a minor league baseball team. My guests this evening are Bill Baldison, chairman of the Missoula Baseball Advocates, and Carl Englund, chairman of that group's finance committee. We'll hear from these gentlemen in a few minutes. It's been some 30 years since Missoula has had a professional baseball team. But Missoula and professional baseball have seen several changes since that time. To open our discussion, reporter Frank Field looks back at Missoula's pro baseball days. Then reporter Teresa Bell examines the problem at hand, what it would take now to get profe professional baseball back in Missoula. The Wiz kids had won it, Bobby Thompson had done it, and Yogi read the comics all the while. Rock and roll was being born, marijuana we would scorn, so down on the corner the national pastime went on trial. We're talking baseball, Klazuski if you were talking baseball in Missoula in the 1950s, you were talking about the city's pioneer league team, the Timberjacks. The Timberjacks came here in 1956 as a farm club for the old Washington Senators, who are now the Minnesota Twins. Missoula resident Joe Dougal recalls that the Timberjacks were never great as a team, but there were some good individual players. There's some awful good players on there, like Cesar Tovar and, and Chuck Weatherspoon and Jim Cotton and Joe Abernathy. Abernathy was a kid that if he'd have just had the right breaks, he'd have gone to the majors. Former bad boy Jeff Herman, who got himself into this 1957 team photo, is now Missoulian sports writer Jeff Herman. He remembers star left-handed pitcher Jim Cott starting his professional career in Missoula. In 1958, Cott's 18 victories led the Timberjacks to the Pioneer League playoffs. And Herman remembers a player who turned out to be a better singer than a ball player. The Charlie Pride, the country western singer, uh, traveled here and had a tryout and made the team, although he only lasted about a month. <laughs> it wasn't just players who made the majors. Manager Jack McKeon started his managerial career in Missoula before going on to Kansas City and San Diego. Dougal says McKeon was fond of mixing up his lineup. Jack was really one heck of a swell guy, and he played, besides being manager, he played every position there was on the team. And... Uh, they put a pitcher in and they have to relieve and put another pitcher in. They run out of pitchers and he might take somebody else that could pitch and put, put him in. Or they, if he wasn't doing any good, he'd pull him out. And he, a lot of times he ended up on the mound pitching himself. Those Timberjacks used to play here at Campbell Field, but only through 1960. The Senators pulled out after 59, and in 1960 the club worked out a partial agreement with the Cincinnati Reds. But that was the last year Missoulians would see the Timberjacks play here. The club just couldn't overcome the cold spring climate, the inability to keep a contract with a major league club, and financial problems. Herman says he remembers games being snowed out. Dougal says people were often more interested in sampling Missoula's great outdoors than watching the Timberjacks. And Herman says the club had trouble making a profit. At the time, the university, they had to rent the field from the university, and there was a rule prohibiting alcohol on the premises. So in terms of the concessions, which was... Uh, made up a large part of the, the revenue, uh, not having beer at the ballpark, I think really handicapped the, the financial end of it. Both Herman and Dougal say Missoula should give professional baseball another try. They say public and major league support and a professional quality facility might be the right combination to bring professional baseball back to Missoula for good. For City Limits, I'm Frank Field. This is Teresa Bell. Last week at City Hall, a group of community leaders spearheading efforts to bring a baseball club back to Missoula discussed their strategies. The steering committee is divided into three subcommittees who focus on finance, site selection, and Pioneer League franchise acquisition. Steering committee chairman and Missoula lawyer Bill Baldison says the biggest obstacle they're facing is financial. 
you know, I think if, if we had to pick a better or, or the, the most appropriate economic times, these wouldn't be it. Um, you know, because I think everybody's concerned about money, everybody's concerned about uh, the economy. Yes, the cost of the project could run as high as three million dollars. Um, Site selection chairman and head architect Ike Leland <laughs> explains why. You probably you have to budget at least a million and a half dollars to construct from the ground up, in, in my opinion, a, a decent facility to play professional baseball in. Uh, the cost of the site would be in addition. The site selection committee has narrowed their choices down to five possible fields. The prices of these sites range from nothing to $700,000, but cost isn't the only factor to consider. The southeast corner of Miller Creek Road and Highway 93 is the largest and most expensive site choice. Although the cost is high, there would be excellent potential for expansion here, and it is conveniently located near restaurants and motels. Campbell Field, the former university ballpark next to Dornblazer Field, is also well located and accessible. It's only made up of 15 acres, so expansion would be somewhat limited. Acquisition would also be tricky since the field belongs to the university. Playfair Park, south of the fairgrounds near the Little League Fields, is yet another consideration. The city already owns this park, so there would be no acquisition costs, but once again, this site is very small, only 12 acres. Using this field might also cause problems with Little League games. The land owned by Champion International between McCormick Park and California Street would perhaps be more desirable because of its location. It is close to downtown and has room to expand upon. The cost of this site is still under negotiation. Lindborg Craig Field on Spurgeon Road behind Big Sky High School is the current home of Missoula's American Legion baseball teams. It would be very inexpensive if not free. The good condition of the existing field could minimize construction costs as well. The biggest problem with this site is that it's located far away from the city center. Although the committee has narrowed it down to these five, it will still listen to other site recommendations. The primary construction costs in the building of a professional level ballpark are grading the land, sodding the field, building enough stands to accommodate about 4,000 people, and paving the parking area. Exact funding plans for the project are still vague, but Baldison says the ballpark will have a mixture of funding um, sources. We're, we're, we're talking about uh, possibly a third, uh, you know, private and two-thirds in, in some form of governmental or public financing. But again, um, we may get lucky and find that the private support in, in Missoula is so great that we can generate the majority, if not all, of the the needed money just by private contributions. The Finance Committee discussed possible public funding in the form of a revenue bond, a general obligation bond, and money from the Missoula Redevelopment Agency. Private funding could come from donations and fundraisers, as well as selling boxes to corporations and season tickets to regular fans. The final cost consideration is acquiring a team. While a major league team may provide the players, manager, and coaches, facility operating costs must be borne by the local franchise. Baldison hopes that people in the community will buy stock in the team. Missoula Legion, Legion baseball, baseball president Thank Dennis Shanahan says pro baseball can only help Missoula. Well, I think it would be great. It's uh, just another summer sport, another baseball sport really the only game around Missoula in the summer, you know, other than the softball teams and this type of thing. I, I think it would be great for Missoula. If everything goes as planned, we could have a baseball team in Missoula by 1992. This field, now being used by the Legion teams, seems to be the most popular site among committee members. But even if the new stadium isn't built here at Lindborg Craig Field, the team may have to use this as a temporary playing facility. This is because if the ball doesn't start rolling soon, the stadium may not be ready when the new team arrives. Support of Missoula citizens will determine the momentum and the final outcome. Reporting for City Limits, I'm Teresa Bell. The Craig in Lindbergh Craig Field was Bill Craig, the former mayor of Missoula, who in the 19, early 1980s talked a good deal about trying to get a minor league team back in Missoula. 
Mayor Craig finally got the issue to uh, vote on the ballot, but the times were tough. This was the deep recession of the early 1980s, and it was not to be. But the interest in baseball and getting minor league baseball back in Missoula has not died. It continues to be a very lively topic. And when I began talking about it earlier this year, I found a tremendous amount of support and enthusiasm. We got together a group of citizens to look into the possibility. They've been working for several months now, and they've formed themselves into a number of committees. They've given themselves a name, the Missoula Baseball Advocates, and the chairman of that group is Bill Baldesser. Bill, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what's gone on in the last few months and how we got where we are now. Well, Dan, as you indicated, in response to a solicitation by you and your office, a group of 30 plus individuals met um, and expressed our interest in bringing baseball back to Missoula. Um, we then divided ourselves into three primary committees, the first being a, a site selection committee for the purpose of choosing what we would consider to be the most appropriate site to put a ballpark. Um, the second was the finance committee. Carl is the chairman of that committee to come up with what would probably be or hopefully be the most appropriate financing mechanism for building the ballpark and, and or acquiring the franchise. Uh, the third was the Franchise Acquisition Committee to determine the best way to acquire a franchise, the best way to own it for Missoula, and to establish the contacts and the network that we would need to accomplish that. And then there was also an oversight or a steering committee to kind of oversee the progress of all of the others. Well, before we get into talking about what those committees have done, just say a little bit about how you assess the enthusiasm and so on of the people that have been involved so far. Well, I can't say enough about the people that I've worked with uh, on in the various committees that I'm on. Uh, very qualified people, very competent people, and very motivated people. We have had a great deal of assistance by, by some city folks. Um, as their time allowed and as they could, could give us their time, they provided some expertise and experience that we, we needed very, very greatly. Um, my contacts have been uh, almost universally positive. People that I know and even people that I have not known before have stopped me in various places and, and uh, indicated an interest and a willingness to participate. Um, obviously, uh, we, I, we've not heard from, from uh, other people who are perhaps not quite as strongly in favor, um, but so far the response I've gotten has been totally positive. Why did you get involved, Bill? Dan, I've been involved in, in sports in Missoula since I well, for quite a while, primarily youth sports, um, in connection with my boys. I uh, was involved with Mount Sentinel Little League when my oldest son was nine. He's now uh, almost 20. And then been involved in baseball and Little Grizzly football and in connection with the Legion program. Um, I come from a baseball family uh, and would enjoy, myself enjoy going to the ball games and taking my kids and or grandkids to the, to the ball games. Carl, what about you? What got you involved? Was it because I called you and told you? I <laughs> well, partly because you <laughs> called me and told me. But also because uh, if you look around Montana, Billings has got a team, and Helena has a team, and Great Falls has a team. Missoula would certainly be a great place to have a team. And uh, in addition to that, for a few years I lived in Billings, and uh, I lived uh, at one end of town and worked downtown and had to drive by or walk by Cobb Field in Billings uh, during the summer. And it was just a wonderful place to go spend a, f a few hours and watch a good ball game. And it's just something that's missing in Missoula right now, and we certainly have the ability to get it here uh, if the people in the, in the community really want it. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Why do you think it is that so many people are interested in getting baseball into Missoula? What is it that people see as the great motivation? Why should we do this? Well, I think it's, it's, it's just another thing that adds to the quality of life in Missoula and in the valley. Um, as I was driving home this, this evening, I heard the good news that uh, Patagonia is moving their facility into Missoula. And the reporter indicated that one of the reasons, and Anne-Mary Dusso, Commissioner Dusso indicated that one of the reasons that the Patagonia people were so sold on Missoula was the quality of life here. And that's another thing I believe that would add to the quality of life uh, for Missoulians. 
It's going to take money, though, Carl, right? And that's yes. what your committee's <laughs> been looking at. What, uh, what kinds of questions have you been asking, and what answers have you come up with? Well, what we had to do to start with was to figure out, um, first of all, how much it would take, and then what were the various options that we could have to, to get that money. And we still haven't really answered the first question from a standpoint of understanding today exactly how much money it will take to build a, 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 a ballpark here in Missoula. But we do know that if we talk in, the, in a bracket of, let's say, one to three million dollars, that that is the neighborhood uh, that we'd be shooting at. That's We're, the ballpark. That's right? the ballpark. All right. Okay. Not a whole lot less than that and certainly not a whole lot more than that. And then what the committee did is that we went through all the various ways that you can raise that kind of money. And we just um, put together a long, long list of things that are existing ways that you can find that money and also things that uh, maybe don't exist now, for example, in, in, in state law, that if the legislature had made some changes here or made some changes there that we could, uh, we could utilize. And did you come up with some things then that you think are feasible here in Missoula? Well, what we, uh, what we know now is that the city has the capacity to sell bonds, general obligation bonds, um, and to cover the cost of constructing a ballpark either in the city or immediately outside the city. What we know now is that depending on the future of the Missoula Redevelopment Agency and the Redevelopment District and whether or not that district expands or uh, maybe creates another district, that there may be some money there to contribute to, uh, to the construction of a, of a stadium, depending upon where it's located. And what we know a little bit about is that people who have raised substantial amount of money for other things in Missoula believe that there is some ability to raise private money um, to pay for part of the cost of the construction of a ballpark. And so I guess the bottom line at this point is that we know that we have the capability to do it if people really want to do it. All right. Well, before we get to talking about whether people might want to do it, even if we raise the money, um, would they come? W would we have a team? I believe so, Dan. Um, in, in my capacity as a member of the Franchise Committee, I've contacted a number of different organizations um, and three of them have told me that if we had a ballpark that they would put a team here. Um, so if we can do that, if we can get the people in Missoula to um, approach this pro properly, we can, we can be playing ball. Now the position that I've taken on that is that uh, we should try to line up as much of a commitment for a franchise as we can and then we should figure out which of the alternatives that Carl's group comes up with that's the best for Missoula and if we need to put it to a vote, that we put it to a vote, but that we wouldn't actually build the, f the facility until we knew we had a franchise. Is that how your people are looking at it? Yeah, that's exactly it, the advice I've received. Um, get your ballpark committed in terms of location, in terms of plans, in terms of financing, but don't do anything. Don't turn a, a blade full of dirt uh, until you get um, the, the franchise itself. But I've been told by a number of different people that if we get the facility committed, it would, we will be amazed at the amount of interest that uh, will be shown by baseball people throughout the country. Why don't we take a look at the sites again and talk a little bit about some of the considerations for those sites. And you've sat in, I think, on most of the site committee work, so maybe mm -hmm. you can tell us some of the pros and cons of some of these sites, mm -hmm. okay? okay. Uh, the first one that, is, uh, that we'll talk about is Campbellfield, where uh, the Timberjacks played before. Yeah, the Timberjacks played there, and then the, uh, that was the home of the uh, American Legion Mavericks and Reds for a while. One of the uh, obvious advantages is it's got a baseball history. Uh, it's relatively centrally located. It has easy access, being on the corner of South Avenue and Higgins. Uh, a problem is that it's... It's uh, relatively small, so we don't have a great deal of, of additional room. And a real problem at this point is that it's university-owned, and, and uh, we've not been able to get a commitment from the university as to exactly how much money they wanted and even whether they would, would uh, let us sell it or to us or, or let us lease it. Okay. 
Now, Lindbergh Craig Field is the field where the Legion teams play already, and uh, that one is probably much further along than any of the other sites. As far as site development, absolutely. Um, obviously, the advantage is there. Uh, we could get it reasonably inexpensively. Existing Legion arrangement is $1 a year with, from the county. Um, there's no reason to believe that we couldn't just slide right into that lease. Um, disadvantage there, um, it's a little bit further removed from the center of things, uh, although if and when the Reserve Street improvement comes in, access there would be a little bit easier and a little bit better. Something that I learned just recently, that field may not be aligned quite the way we would ultimately want it to be to take advantage of the sun. Okay, the sun would be in the batter's eyes? The way it's set up right now, yeah. All right. Uh, now, you said that your son's favorite spot is the Miller Creek one. This is near your home. Has he got a favorite tree that he's going to perch in? No, I think he'll probably try to sneak over the fence All if right. I know him. But, yeah, that, the Miller Creek site is uh, out by my house. Um, advantage there is it's plenty large enough to accommodate anything we might want to do in terms of perhaps a practice field, a playground for the kids, you know, anything else. One of the big disadvantages is the cost. At this point, when I talk to the owner and the owner's representatives, it's at about $700,000. We may be able to negotiate it a little bit better, but right now, that's the kind of number we're talking about. Part of what caught my attention and got me to thinking about baseball earlier this year was a suggestion that because of the change in use at the Champion site down on the riverfront, that a lot of that land is going to become available. The workers are going to continue to operate part of the plant, but a lot of it is going to change into some new use, and that seems like an interesting spot to put a ballpark. That, yeah, of all the downtown locations that might be available, that's probably the best. Uh, it would not be that difficult to improve. Um, at this point, we don't know exactly what Champion wants to do with it, although they have indicated that, that they want to talk to us. Um, they may would be willing to lease it to us. They may, for their public relations purposes, be willing to do something much more favorable. Uh, at this point, we don't know. Um, putting the ballpark there, of all of the sites, putting the ballpark there probably improves the city uh, as much as anything. It fits right into existing uh, riverfront plans and, and walkway plans. It does have some access problems on, on both east and west, but I, I think those can probably be uh, overcome. Now, down at Playfair Park near Sentinel High School, Little Leaguers play there now? They play, well, they don't play on the particular site that we're, we're looking at, but they play just adjacent uh, to it. Advantage to that site is it's already city ground. We wouldn't have any acquisition costs. We would be able to use all of the uh, available funding um, mechanisms that Carl discussed. Um, disadvantage, it's relatively small. We may have some conflict between using that facility uh, and existing uses, Little League uses, and, and that kind of thing. Let's just get back to one issue that you raised when you were talking about Lindbergh Craig Field, and that's the issue of which direction the sun comes onto the field. What, what other kinds of considerations like that are there to take into account, or why do you worry about where the sun is? Well, primarily because you want a ballpark to, to favor the hitter rather than the defensive team. Why is that? Uh, well, it would make it a heck of a lot more <laughs> interesting All right. uh, for the fans rather than watching somebody squint and swing and miss three times and go sit down. Um, you know, and there, to be honest with you, at some point in the very near future, we're probably going to get... Um, some professional um, assistance in that process, and, and we've been had uh, we've had um, these resources made available to us as soon as we want to take advantage of them. I think one of the most interesting features of the discussions so far is that uh, when you start talking to people about it, everybody's got their opinion about what a good ballpark would be and why a ballpark is a, a fun sort of thing to do. Uh, what kinds of things have you heard about that, Carl? Why, what do people think of when they think of baseball in Missoula in the summertime? What's the picture that they paint? Well, usually they just, people have been somewhere and uh, where they have a ballpark and they just enjoy going out to the park and, and enjoy taking their family out and enjoy the long summer evenings that we have at the ballpark. We have people, obviously, who think that there's uh, some economic benefit to the community. Certainly, the ball 
a, a ball team here would generate some, some interest from outside the community. People would come to Missoula, maybe spend the night, spend some money at the ballpark. We have those kinds of interests. Uh, and then, of course, there are a lot of people in town uh, whose kids are in, are in sports who hope maybe someday that their, 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 their kid will play here, as well as uh, people who, who, uh, who have seen uh, minor league uh, teams in other places, uh, who've seen some people who are now stars in the majors and like to talk about they remember the days when George Brett played in Billings or something like that. And so right. uh, there is a lot of interest uh, from a lot of varied kinds of directions. Though what the town will have to balance is the, those advantages and the fun that might be involved against the costs and where we'll come up with the money. How are those decisions going to get made or what's going to happen in the next few months, Bill? Well, we decided very early on, and it became more apparent as we went on that our original decision was correct, that this whole project was, was a very large project and we really had to narrow it down and make it manageable and, and handleable which I think we've done um, up to this point. We are now going to start getting the people either more informed and or more involved. Um, we hope to have two meetings in January, one on the 9th and one on the 23rd, both held at, at the City Hall in the City Council Chambers, both in the evening to both let the people know where we are and, and let them tell us what they like and what, what they don't like. Um, again, we hope to have our decision made by the middle or end of February um, so that if it's necessary to, to as Carl indicated, try to, try to uh, put a, a bond issue on the ballot, we have time to do that uh, both legally and appropriately so that people know really what they're voting on. Okay, if people want to get involved in this process even before January, can they still do that? Oh, absolutely, sure. We, um, we welcome that. We, we've, we've gone as far as we can with the committees that we've got. We've I've got the five sites. If somebody thinks there's another site that perhaps we should have considered but didn't, for example, let me know. More well, than happy to consider it. All the work that's been done so far has been done by these volunteers in these committees. And uh, th it doesn't exclude anyone. Anyone that said they wanted to be a part of the committee all of a sudden started getting notices that we were meeting usually at ungodly hours in the morning and uh, once a week or once every other week to get this work done and the more people who come the more expertise we'll have the more ideas we'll have and we can be assured that we're not forgetting something obvious uh, along the way well this has been a great process and i think the more people in missoula get involved the better thank you bill and carl for being on the show this evening and getting this series launched this show will be rebroadcast on mcat on wednesday november twenty first at five thirty the next in the City Limits series will be broadcast on December 11th at 7.30 in the evening. It will be produced by the radio and television students at the University of Montana, and that time I will be their guest, and they will be asking me a series of questions. Until then, we'll look forward to seeing you on December 11th. This is Dan Chemis for City Limits. Good night. He was winning, Hank Aaron was beginning, one Robbie going out, one coming in. Kiner and Mitch could tell, the thumper and Mel Parnell, and Ike was the only one winning down in Washington. I'm talking baseball, Klazuski Campanella, I'm talking baseball, it's the man and Bobby Teller, the scooter, the barber and the duke. They knew them all from Boston to Dubuque, especially Willie, Mickey and the Duke.